How's it going everyone? This video is going to be about the geography of Greenland and how if you look at a standard map of the world, it does not accurately present Greenland's location very well. It doesn't represent Greenland's size that well either. And that's because you're taking a spherical surface and projecting it onto a rectangle, which distorts things. Now, when you look at Greenland's actual size and location on the spherical surface of the Earth, and we will do that, then it becomes very quickly, very clear why Greenland is so strategically important to the United States. That said, the distorted image of the world that we see on a standard world map also serves an important purpose, and we will talk about that too and how Greenland's importance relates to other locations that are talked about in the news a lot, specifically Canada, the Panama Canal, and Russia and Yemen. So let's get straight into it. When you look at a standard map of the world, it looks like Greenland is this huge landmass that's between Canada and Iceland. Okay, there's Canada, there's Greenland, there is Iceland. Well, what if I told you that Greenland is actually between Canada and Russia? Now you might think, okay, you know, maybe kind of, cause they're both around the North Pole and Greenland's close to the North Pole. Well, no, not kind of. Greenland, you could say, is more between Canada and Russia than Alaska is between Canada and Russia. And to see that, let's go to our friend Google Earth. So. We are going to zoom in here. There's North America. And there is Greenland. Now, we see, first of all, Greenland is much smaller than what it looks like right here. But more than that, see this peninsula here, okay? On top of that peninsula is the city Murmansk. And that region is where Russia's northern fleet is located and the bulk of russia's population is in this region here let's look at a political map okay there's the north pole there's greenland there's murmansk there we see moscow st petersburg this is where russia's main population centers are now where are canada's main population centers well Again, this is Russia's main population centers. And then we go to Canada and well, there's Canada's main population centers right here, right? You have Montreal, you have Toronto, you have Ottawa, which is the capital. And just south of that, you have Chicago, you have New York, you have Washington, DC, and you have other major United States cities, right? So major United States and Canadian cities clumped together in this region. Then we have the Arctic region, Greenland, and Russia's major cities clumped in this region here. So yes, Greenland is between Canada and Russia, more so than Alaska, because yeah, there's Canada, there's Alaska, there's Russia, but here Russia is quite sparsely populated. And here Canada is quite sparsely populated. When we look at where the major population centers are, Greenland is quite in between. Now, why does that matter? Well, if we look at this map here, right, we see the polar ice cap, okay? This is that white region here, right? Arctic ice cap. And sometimes it extends, right? And some of these waters are frozen sometimes as well. But with temperatures warming up, the ice around the Arctic is melting more than before, and these waterways are becoming accessible more than they were in the past. Now we can look at them specifically on a map here, okay? So there's the Northwest Passage, and there is the Northeast Passage, okay? Now, what do you notice about them? Well, the Northwest one goes right by Greenland, okay? And the Northeast one, well, it's like not right by Greenland, but pretty close to it. Now, 
with these passageways becoming more accessible, with more polar ice melting, they're becoming much more important for the global economy. They're becoming much more practical sea routes to use, right? So if we're going to see these sea routes used much more often, it becomes very advantageous to have control of these sea routes, to have easy access of these sea routes, okay? Now, why is that especially important for the United States? Well, one reason is you have the American-Russian rivalry, which is the biggest geopolitical rivalry since World War II. And another reason is you have just economic benefits, right? And this is Alaska, which is, which is American territory right here. But also, if you look at a map of the United States, all right, it has access to the North Atlantic Ocean and the North Pacific Ocean, right? Because it has its East Coast and its West Coast. And to be able to sail from the East Coast to the West Coast is pretty important for the United States. And there's really only two practical ways that that can be done, okay? Either through the Northwest Passage, like so, past Greenland, or through the Panama Canal, like so, right? Now, that Northwest Passage, of course, it's, it's past Greenland, but it's, it's mostly passed through Canadian waters, right? Now, what do you hear being talked about in the news a lot when Greenland is mentioned? What else is mentioned? Canada and the Panama Canal, all right? All three of these places, Panama Canal, Greenland, Canada, what do they have in common? They are all important for that purpose of practically sailing between the American East Coast and the American West Coast, all right? Now, what are the other options? Why are these the only two practical options to sail between these two coasts? Well, the other option is the northeastern sea route, right? Ships could go like this, all the way around like that, past Alaska and down here, but then they're sailing by Russia and the United States and Russia don't always get along very well, right? So that could be a more difficult route for the United States, okay? What other options do we have? Well, there is going all the way south around the southern tip of South America, past Antarctica, and then all the way up. Not only is this route much longer, it's also dangerous, okay? This passage here between Antarctica and South America, this is called Drake's Passage, and it's one of the most difficult areas in the world for ships to navigate. Right? And that has to do with the, uh, the ocean conditions there. Now, specifically why it's difficult, maybe that can be the subject of a future video. And if you're interested, you can let me know in the comments. We can talk about the fluid dynamics of this passage right here. So that's the problem there. Now, what else is an option? Well, one could sail all the way south around South Africa and then past India and to the United States. That way, that clearly is a very long journey. To cut that journey short, one could go through the Suez Canal right here, okay? Sailing through the Mediterranean, past the Suez Canal, and then past Yemen and onward across the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean to the United States. Now, if you've been following the news surrounding Yemen, then you know that that's not a very comfortable place for American ships to sail past right now either. So the only practical ways to sail between the East Coast and the West Coast, either you're going through the Panama Canal or you're going through the Northwest Passage past Greenland and Canada. So there's the sailing reason. There's the economic reason because you have this Northwest Passage and the Northeast Passage that are economically becoming much, much more important uh, sea routes for the global economy. And then you have the rivalry with Russia. Okay, uh, let's look at that political map again. All right, look how close this coast of Greenland is to Murmansk. Much closer than Alaska, 
these islands here, that's Norway, and these islands here, that is Russia. That makes the territory of Greenland very important to the United States as well. So, now a question may arise if this map here distorts the image of not just Greenland, but other places as well. Like, look at Antarctica. It looks like a massive continent, okay, that, that's far bigger than any other continent in the world, right? But in reality, like, look at Antarctica. Yeah, it's, it's not that big, right? So if this standard map of the world distorts images so much, well, then why do we use it? Well, we use it for a very good reason. When it comes to the spherical surface, you cannot look at the whole thing all at once, okay? When it comes to a rectangle, you can look at the whole thing all at once, right? But the problem is you cannot unwrap a spherical surface onto a rectangle. If you ever tried to wrap something like a ball in wrapping paper, well, then you know that that wrapping paper is not going to go over the ball neatly. It's going to fold or crumple, that sort of thing. Alternatively, imagine peeling an orange in a special way such that you don't have different pieces of orange peel. So it all peels off as one big connected piece of orange peel. Is it possible to peel an orange in that way such that that one big connected piece of orange peel is a rectangle? The answer is no, it's not possible. Okay. So the question then is, how can we approximately project a spherical surface onto a rectangle? You're going to have to take that orange peel and stretch it or squish it in some places. So this way of stretching that orange peel is called the Mercator projection. And we could do a separate video on the exact mathematics of that. What I'll show you here is the general idea. So let's go. Here is your Earth, all right? And, or as our analogy says, here is your orange. And there's our equator. Now let's say we cut it in this way, into these kind of slices, all right? Now you're going to see what happens when we unfold this orange. All right. What is it going to look like? Well, or when we unfold this orange peel, it will look something like this. All right. So we have them connected where we drew our equator and forgive my lovely uh, artwork here and so on. You're going to have more of these slices than, uh, than just the five that I'm drawing, but let's just say five. All right. Well, that's almost a rectangle. Okay. We can imagine how it could almost perfectly fit into a rectangle like this. All right. All we have to do is stretch out the tops and the bottoms, right? So if we imagine lines like this if we stretch it this way towards those lines and we do that right here towards these lines that go in the middle and we do that for every single one of these slice like pieces well, then we will be able to fill a rectangle. Okay. The problem is you may notice that the farther we are from the equator, the more sideways stretching, right? The more horizontal stretching is going on. Okay. So if we take this region right here, it's not being stretched that much. But if we take this region right here, you have to stretch it farther for those parts of the surface to meet. And as a result, everything, the, the farther something is from the equator, the more stretched out it's going to be horizontally. Okay. And let me show you what that's going to look like. All right. 
let's say we have a smiley face. Okay. Now, realistically, people's eyes are in the middle of their head, not at the top, but for the sake of this demonstration, I'm putting the mouth in the middle and the eyes at the top. If we were to project this onto a rectangle, as described above, okay, well, the mouth is around the equator, so that's going to look the same, but the eyes are going to stretch sideways, and that's going to look something like this, all right? Now, that is not an accurate representation of the shape of those islands, if those eyes are islands. So how do we fix that? Well, we're going to have to stretch upward in order to make those eyes look round again. And for anything in the southern hemisphere, we have to stretch downward too. Okay, so back to our image here, not only do we stretch sideways as these red arrows show, but we're also going to stretch this map upward and downward. And as a result, what will our smiley face look like? Well, it's going to look something like this. All right, so the eyes are round, but they're much bigger. But that's okay because the shape of the eyes is preserved. And that's what's important when it comes to navigation. So if we go back to our map here, all right, yes, Greenland is much bigger, Canada looks much bigger, uh, Russia as well looks much bigger, Antarctica looks much bigger than reality, but the shape of the coast is represented accurately. And you can look at the shapes of all the coasts at the same time because it's all projected onto a rectangle. Now, if you're sailing, it's important to know what the shape of the coast is, okay? So you know where your ship is and what your ship is going to interact with, okay? As for size, that's not as important when you're sailing, okay? Because you just have a different factor that you'd multiply by in order to imagine how big something really is compared to other continents, right? But when you're sailing, you're not going to be interacting with Antarctica and, say, Cuba at the same time, right? These locations are, are very far from one another. So it's okay that the map represents, uh, sorry, I said Antarctica, I meant Greenland. So it's okay if the map represents Greenland as much more large relative to Cuba than it is in real life, okay? You, you don't need to make that comparison practically. Whether you're sailing around Cuba or whether you're sailing around Greenland, this map gives you an accurate shape of the coastline and that is why it serves an important purpose, even in the Arctic, okay? If you're sailing through the Northwestern Passage, you have an accurate depiction of the shape of the coastline here. If you're sailing through the Northeastern Passage, you have an accurate depiction of the shape of the coastline here. So I hope that clears things up, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.